Gavin, uh, this movie, uh, what did you see as your biggest challenge? Was it the casting? Was it uh, taking this story from this novel, adapting it for a movie, and also the issue of having sort of a romance in the movie that's not really a romance with mm -hmm. Asa and Hallie? Our romance was real, dude. My romance with Bob was real. Yeah, all of us. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, um, to, the, to the question of the, the challenges, obviously a film like this has a number of challenges, firstly in the adaptation um, of the book, which um, I'm a huge fan of. The tricky thing about the book, of course, is it's a very internal story. The author writes beautifully about what the character is thinking and feeling, and translating that into film is not always so easy. But um, we, we worked very hard, all of us, during the script writing process on how we could capture the spirit of the book using our medium. Um, and of course, we have living, breathing actors um, who can reflect an emotion in Which the book second, doesn't have. Which the book doesn't have, yes. Yes, the book, that's a good point. The book doesn't have Sometimes living, Sometimes you forget. But, but it's true, so, so, so in some ways it's difficult, but in other ways it's easier because the book might need two or three paragraphs to describe what a character is feeling, and with great actors like you know, Harrison Ford or Sir Ben Kingsley or Viola Davis, or our young actors, Asa Butterfield, Haley Steinfeld, you can get in a second off of a great right. reaction shot a great deal of information about what the character is feeling. But you have to have great actors to achieve that. So to your question about casting, now once you structure the script in ways that the conflict is good and the reactions should follow, you need actors that can really deliver on those reactions. And I think we were very fortunate to get the kind of cast that we got and that came onto this movie because the layers of complexity in this movie would not be easy to reveal with a, without a cast as good as the one we got. <laughs> so how many kids did you see to find Ender? Oh, so, so Ender, we pro oh, I don't know, over a hundred, uh, hundreds. Lot, I mean, lots. In a lot of cities and a lot of countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we auditioned all over the world. Mm -hmm. And, of course, until we found Asa Butterfield, we were very nervous. We saw some amazing kids of younger ages, amazing. But the emotional demands of this movie on that young lead are as you, I think you guys have seen the movie, mm -hmm. so sorry for me. Uh, but yeah, I, the emotional demands on a young actor in this movie were enormous, and the, the subtleties that he needed to convey were mm -hmm. enormous. And we saw some wonderful young actors, but not all of them could deliver up against Harrison Ford. And Asa could. And the romantic angle? The non -romantic I, I, think, I think there's a very interesting thing. You know, you're in a military environment where discipline is very strict, and yet these are young people who, what I like about it is in the midst of the harshness, there's a need for gentleness and for um, compassion and, frankly, friendship. And I think that that's, um, at the given their young ages, um, th I think that Haley and Asa deliver beautifully on this genuine, um, kind, uh, amusing, intelligent friendship. Um, and we obviously didn't want to, nor could we take it further. It, these are young people in a military environment and the, the close watch of military personnel. But Bob and I do, did perform very beautifully during our tests on um, the notion of how <laughs> Petra and Asa would, 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 would find that moment. Yes, when, when, we, when we pitched the movie, we, we would recreate the scene in which uh, they float together. So Gavin would hold me very gently <laughs> as I would <coughs> point my laser gun. And, and if we were together, we would, we would do it right now. <laughs> uh, yes, and you were going to say. Floating. We wanted a sense yeah. of ballet and beauty. <laughs> to that moment when they go out in the moonlight. I mean, that moment when they jump out together into the moonlight is a moment of gentleness in a rather harsh environment. And that we recreated that moment a million we times. Do it one more. <laughs> Let us do it one more time. And then bring him close and look over the shoulder. All right. Well, when we saw it last night, it was on IMAX, but not 3D. Is this not going to be in 3D? And if you made that choice, why? This seemed like the perfect, I'm not that much of a fan of 3D, this is a perfect new movie for 3D. 3D gives me a headache a little bit. Maybe it's because I'm getting older or something. Uh, I, I like 3D in animation. I don't necessarily always love it. Uh, it can be such a gimmick, you know? I haven't seen Gravity yet, so I got to Gravity say is magnificent, I yeah. have to say. Is it? I, I, I'm going to try and give you a quick technical answer to that because it's a great question. The battle room fights would have been great in 3D. Awesome. 
However, the place we struggled is in the deep space battles at the end. Now, if you watch Gravity, and I won't make this too long, what's genius about <laughs> Gravity That's is that... Lie. It's a lie. Um, <laughs> she, she knows me so well. Um, is that you've, you're close up on actors, but then you, 3D works best when you have foreground, midground, and background. Mm -hmm. And the problem with deep space stuff... In Gravity, you've got foreground, midground, because they're always around some spaceship. Our problem, when we tested for 3D in the deep space stuff, when you you're looking it. at a distant planet... It doesn't go 3D and 3D. If you look at the moon, it looks 2D because the <laughs> distances are so great. And what happens is your spaceships at great distances start to look like little toys. And it detracts from the moment. So this is a long... Parts of our movie would be awesome in 3D. Parts of our movie would not have worked. And frankly, this is an independent movie where... My wonderful producers really did everything they could to get the money we could do to make this film as well as possible in 2D. And I think we would have been overreaching. But we didn't shoot for 3D. No, That's the other thing. I'll give you it one other good answer. It wasn't constructed for 3D. No. It was constructed. And at the risk of hogging the floor, which is quite right, I will do. The other reason <laughs> is this is a very intimate story about a boy. And one of the things that we're able to use in the film is longer lenses to isolate him, blow the backgrounds out of focus, get inside his eyes. 3D doesn't like that. 3D prefers you to use wider lenses because when things are out of focus and yet it's in 3D, it bothers you. So in the end, we feel like the 2D was the right format for this film, to, to study the characters intimately and to, to really have that feeling in our final battle scenes of something of scale. Ironically, the 3D was making the scale feel less, not more, in that section. We like to say our characters are 3D. Now, please don't ask me any more questions, which Gigi will fire This is a question for Bob. Uh, you've been involved in producing other projects that have had uh, multi-generation appeal and high expectations, things like Star Trek and Transformers. What, what is the level of difficulty and responsibility in adapting Ender's Game compared to those other projects? Well, those other projects I wrote, so this one I got to approach very much as a fan and evaluate Gavin's material as it came in and so for me I was just okay now I get to be a fan I think Gigi and I both got to just be fans because we both read the book and we both knew what we wanted to, you know what we thought it needed to be and so I got to be very much of a, a self-righteous fan and say do I like this or don't I is this is this true to the spirit of the book or am I gonna get mad and when I read it I thought you know what this is actually true to the book and I'm actually I, I myself was was such a fan of the book for so long that I'm not sure I would have had the perspective frankly to, to do it justice. So for me, it was a relief to, to, to read a script and say, wow, that actually, that could be the movie. And, I, and, I'm, and, I, and because I'm not on the hook for being, you know, burned at the stake for whether or not I wrote it badly, I got, I got, to, <laughs> I got to really evaluate it as a fan. And so I got to be very honest with myself and say, that is true what I remember of the book. That is true to what I love about it. And I couldn't have done it better. So it was, it was, it was a relief. <laughs> so, um, Bob, you've been a fan for a long time. Can you talk about discovering the book, what it meant to you then, and then what you see in it now? And then I don't know if the rest of you have longer histories with Ender's Game or not, but um, just... Well, let's start with how we all got in here. Yeah, Gigi's the longest history, so let's let her... Hit it. I, uh, <laughs> I, got, I, I got this book many, many years ago from my nephew, who was in eighth grade at the time. And he was a young boy, and he s had a hard time reading. He struggled with reading. And he came to me, and we were very close, and he said, I've read this book, and it was really great. And my first thought was, you read a book? I was, I was amazed. And then I read the book, and we talked, and it was a great conversation. And I remember very clearly thinking, this book allowed these two people, a young boy and a mm. middle-aged woman, to have an incredibly <laughs> interesting conversation. And that's really something. And he then said, wouldn't it make a great movie? And okay. to cut to the end, that little boy is now a father and is studying for his Ph.D., and we just finished the movie. So it's <laughs> been a really ago. long journey, um, but I loved the book from that moment. And I read it at the same age. I read it when I was in junior high. My <laughs> uncle, who got me into all things sci-fi, got me into it, and I just thought it was amazing. So it's always an aunt or an uncle. It is. It's, Clearly. It's, a, it's an actually a family affair somehow. And... At the time, I just loved that it didn't talk down to me as a, as a young dude. I liked that it celebrated intelligence. I liked that it was complicated. It had adult themes. Never imagined I'd be working on it. When I got into this business years later, I checked in on it and found out, oh, the studios have it. Warner Brothers has it or someone else has it. And 
and they're messing it all up, I could tell. And so I just thought, oh, you know, that's, that, that'll be something that's probably unmakeable. And then so then when, when, when Gigi called us all together and we all had the same instinct to be true to it and not try to make it kind of the Hollywood ending version of the book that could have been easily turned into and, and be true to it and, you know, obviously reading Gavin's script, that's when I, I couldn't believe that something I'd read as a 12-year-old suddenly I was going to I was gonna get to work on. And then Gavin read it. You read it only a few years ago. Yeah, I, I, I read it five years ago because my agent, I was looking for an opportunity to do an adaptation again. I'd done it on Sotsi and really enjoyed it. And, um, and I felt I would like to write the script for my next project as opposed to doing one that was being written by 20 people while shooting. But that's another story. Um, <laughs> And so, I, so, I, so this book was sent to me, and I read it, and I had no idea of its history. I just read this book, and I went, wow, why am I relating to this book? And I was drafted as Bob and Gigi, you know, when I was 17 years old. And it was bringing up all these feelings of being taken from your home far away, being in this environment where people are yelling and screaming at you and, frankly, praising you for aspects of your personality that mm. are the, not the aspects of your personality that your mother would praise, you know, <laughs> being more aggressive, um, being less sympathetic to, you know, just, just this more aggressive environment. And it was a very disturbing time of my life. And, um, and I came out, you know, questioning my own nature and my, you know, my world. And, and I thought, wow, that's what this kid is doing. He's in this environment where he's ultimately compelled to take responsibility for his own choices and his own nature. To me, Ender is not a good kid fighting bad things, which we've seen in many movies. He's a complex kid who's capable of tremendous compassion, but also capable of real aggression. And at some point, he has to find his own balance and, and take responsibility for his own moral choices in the world. So it's, in that sense, a beautiful coming-of-age story, and one that I, looking back, related to. And to Gigi's point, I just love the fact that with this book, I have a nephew as well who's now finishing high school who loves this book, and the conversations that we're able to have as adult with younger people about the themes after, I hope, having had really cool fun. I hope <laughs> that the movie's cool and fun and right. big and, and special and we worked so hard on all those visual effects. But at the end of the day, if it can generate a conversation as it did for you and your nephew, me and mine, that's something that I don't always get in a movie. It's either their kind of movie or my kind of movie. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping this crosses over with parents and kids and forges a little bit of a conversation whilst at the same time being hugely entertaining. That was our hope, right? Yep. When we went in. Well, that's what we tried to do. <laughs> Hi. Um, I love the casting. I love that it's very diverse. And also that these kids are outsiders. So they look like outsiders. Yeah. They're not jocks. <laughs> yes. As you, in most <laughs> movies, you expect these top-notch students to be jocks. Right. So in the book, was it as diverse? Or where did, where did it come in that you knew it was going to be a diverse cast? Um, in, in the book, it's diverse. But some characters are not specified um, as of a particular, or uh, Dink, for example, is, um, I don't think we know what his, so, but, but for me, this is the international station, and it needs to be diverse, and, um, and we found kids, frankly, from all over the world that we auditioned, and I think we were very lucky. I mean, there was yeah. no one who was going to play the part of a lie as well as, sur as Surridge. Yeah. He just was the best actor for the job, and so I, I think what, what, what was most important in, the, in casting this movie mm -hmm. was to find kids that were genuinely smart. You know, you can fake a lot of things, but you can't fake smart. Um, and you can't fake deep compassion. And these kids have it. They are genuinely nice, intelligent, thinking kids. Um, and they got on with each other so well and had so much fun. We sent them on the space camp before we started the movie. We sent them for six weeks of training. <laughs> and they trained with astronauts. They trained with military instructors in how to march and salute. And they bonded. And they bonded. And they trained with Cirque du Soleil performance and how to work on the wires. So by the time we got to the set, that kind of physical stuff was out of the way. And we could focus on the emotional work that was, you know, deep for kids of this age. It's, it's a kid's movie, uh, but it's deep kid's movie. <laughs> So um, I think we were lucky with our cast. But that, but that <laughs> point is a good point because that's one of the things about the book that personally for me was really, it really resonated because we're in a world where we're beyond boundaries and we're beyond right. national 
definitions, and people have all just kind of bonded together. It's, it's why the world of Ender's Game isn't dystopian. It's really hopeful. It's really positive, um, which is something I think we all responded to in the material, is that it's not that, you know, oh, it's another Armageddon Bleak world where future. everything's a disaster. Yeah. It's not. It's a, it's a beautiful world worth saving where we all are together. Um, and that is the place it comes from. And I think that was important to all of us to make sure that we reflected that in the movie. Yeah. It's kind of following up questions. It's uh, Isa is uh, from England, and he has a British accent. But uh, you guys keep his Americans. So is it like a this is an American, uh, the International Free School, or no, is it just a It's a very good this? question because it sort of follows on from the other the, the other question. In the book, he's in America. His father is a Polish immigrant in the book, so dad speaks with an accent. Um, in the movie. So we were trying to be true to the book in that sense because in the book he's, he's a young American kid and his dad is from Poland who was brought t onto the program and failed. And his sister and brother have been through the program and failed. So that's the only reason because he, he has to speak the same accent as the rest of his family. Um, I think that the, the, I want to talk just briefly, as, uh, pick on what Gigi said also about the world to your question. What we try to do in some of those views from space of the world is, is really feel how beautiful our planet is. But at the same time, our political institution is paranoid. Mm -hmm. So I, I, it's the world that's worth saving is our beautiful planet. Some people in Europe picked up on this very much, like, wait a minute, is the, wor the world of the planet is beautiful and worth saving. The political institution that's becoming more militarized because of fear and paranoia is definitely something that needs to be changed. And part of Ender's journey is to question. present, to question right. that, and say to Graf at the end, the important thing for me at the end is he's not only mad about the fact that he feels they've made a morally bad choice, he also feels it's strategically stupid to think that the way you win doesn't matter. He's, he's, he's still strategically right. smart, and that's the impact that Harrison talked about on him. It's like, this kid is smarter than I even thought. I thought that if I manipulated him to win, He'd be that's happy. all that mattered. Right. But actually, if I'd given him the real information, he might have strategically been better equipped because we've now given ourselves a reputation as genocidal maniacs. <laughs> and maybe Ender's <laughs> anger is not just that it's morally stupid, it's also strategically stupid. So I hope that comes across. But anyway. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask you, a little, can you talk a little bit more about the, the grown-ups that are in this? Because you have some wonderful actors, you know, Harrison Ford, you've got Viola Davis, you've got Sir Ben. <laughs> And I want to talk to you, you know, if you could talk about working with them. And also, Gavin, for you specifically, did the inner 12-year-old in you, were you, like, totally excited that you had Han Solo in your movie? Yes. <laughs> the inner 12-year-old in me, which you can see is uh, uh, the kids who said, oh, Gavin's the biggest kid on set. It's like, I kind of am in a way because there's so powerful feelings when you're that age, you know. Um, both in terms of, uh, uh, yes, when I was young, I jumped out of airplanes and I climbed mountains and I did all sorts of stupid things for adrenaline rushes. So the notion of leaping out into a zero gravity battle school, I want to do that. I still want to do that. I think we all want to do that. That was just great. But at the same time, you're up against Harrison Ford and both myself and Asa Butterfield had a moment where Harrison Ford walked on the set. And my inner 12 year old and his lit literal 12 year old were a little intimidated. Um, but this was good. This I'm was over awesome. It. We used it because <laughs> We all did. <laughs> we used it, and I even spoke to Harrison about it. And we, we shot the film in sequence, partly because our little Asa grew two inches during the course of shooting, which made wardrobe crazy, but partly because he grew emotionally through the course of that film, and Harrison very much used that slight intimidation from the beginning, not in any way unkindly. He just kept him a little bit at a distance, mm -hmm. And the intimidation of Asa Butterfield to icon actor Harrison Ford was perfect for Ender Wigan to Colonel Graff. And gradually through the course of shooting, as Asa's confidence grew, he became more and more ready to take on that final scene where I think it's one of Gigi's favorite moments, that moment where he said, you lied! And this animal man <laughs> comes out of this little boy and hits Harrison Ford in the face. So, uh, yeah, I think Harrison's iconic status actually really helped us from a performance point of view. This has been a somewhat tumultuous journey from the time this book was written until it has now made it to the screen through various incarnations in various hands. Now that it landed in your hands, the end result is here and it's about to open to the world. 
What have you each learned about yourselves or taken away from this experience of bringing Ender's Game to life? Well, I'll just say that um, limits. We, we had an exhausting period. My producers had to um, endure my passion, my fears. Um, and I think that what, what I learned out of this is, is the same kind of thing that Asa learns, that at some point, you know, you have an emotional, you have so much emotional reserves. And, and I, we just, I was just lucky to have an incredibly strong, supportive group of people around making this. I know that sounds melodramatic, but <laughs> it's exhausting trying to bring a film with, with this kind of fan base, with young actors who can only work five hours a day, working up against icons, um, there were times it was really, really, really stressful for all of us f from you know, the kinds of physical effects, digital effects. I just learned to appreciate the fact that you need a strong support group and you gotta trust that support group. Um, and, and I was lucky to have an incredible crew, incredible cast. The, the movie stars in this movie were anything but um, movie starish. They were people who loved what we were trying to do and genuinely supported the fact that we were trying to make a film for young people that didn't talk down to them. And, and I'm, I'm glad that everybody on the movie wanted to make that movie, because otherwise it would have been just too hard. The young, the young actors, anyone we had a school. 18? Yeah, anyone under 18, because they have to go to school. Yeah. They have to be in school. So they got school. So we had to plan ahead. We had a full-on school. Oh, you shoot in Mexico or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did, yeah. <laughs> so you, you structure, you don't shoot five hours a day. You shoot 12 hours a day, but you structure. So you're constantly moving kids back to the classroom, back on set. But, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the mechanics of this kind of film and the, and the discipline required to make it and the need for incredible precision and support, which is why you see the number of producers we have. They all had very different jobs to try and make this machine work. Um, and, and I think that's what I learned, is the value of your machine being efficient. And I'm hoping to learn that complicated material has a place. I'm uh, hoping so too. I'm yeah. hoping that, because I tend to be, I tend to want easy answers and I tend to be a little bit didactic in my personal life and I like to hit you over the head with my shenanigans. And so to be a part of bringing a book to life that actually asks questions and doesn't exactly give you the answer. and it, it was very interesting on the European tour to get questions that, that said, so this, this movie clearly falls on the side of preemptive war. And then literally the next question from somebody else would be, oh, clearly this, si this book sides on the side of peace. And to me, that's a victory. The idea that we can actually have a, 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 a piece of work that is inviting both kinds of questions depending on where you're coming from, to mm -hmm. me was a, oh, that's an interesting thing. Because to me, I like clarity. We all like clarity. Not having clarity I don't like clarity. <laughs> I really don't. Let's be clear I think about I that. I come from a place that's <laughs> unclear. So maybe that's part of what was so good about us. Well, that's what I mean. And so I, I learned I like to embrace the lack of clarity. You find your clarity. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah we so need to That find to me was clarity. a lesson. You were already there, but for me, it was no, interesting to go. This is great. I like this, the conversation, not right. the answer. I don't have an answer. We don't have answers. Movies don't have answers. They have questions. That's what I hope we are rewarded for. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks. You